Well, let's go to the Lord in prayer real quick. Father, we thank you this day for your word. We thank you for Jesus. Holy Spirit, we give you liberty in this place. Move as it pleases the Father, not as it pleases man. Father, we draw on that anointing. We thank you for the anointing to bring the word of God, and it will not return void, but it will accomplish that that pleases you. We give you praise. Father, I thank you for the hearts of the people, that they're ready to receive your word, that it will minister to them this day. In Jesus' name, we give you praise. Amen. 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 Well, I want to share with you something this morning that's dear to my heart, and we all, or I do, maybe none of you do, but I have a tendency to get away from it sometimes. But I want to talk with you about the words of our mouth. Um, I want to ask you a question to begin with. If Jesus came in here today and said to you from this day forward, whatever you say is how your life will be, would that change what you say? Think about that. If he came in here this morning and said to you, whatever you say from now on, that's what you will have. Would it change your vocabulary? Would it change the way we talk? Based on that, are your words filled with faith or are they filled with fear? Fear is the opposite of faith. Faith can't operate where fear is present. So as we study this today, I want us to look at ourselves and and like I said, it's for me as much as it is for you because I have to refresh myself. If we read in the book of James, chapter 3, and James is one of my favorite books in the Bible, if you, I believe James was the brother of Jesus. I believe that he didn't believe, and most of his brothers, maybe all of them, never believed in Jesus till after he was dead and gone. So when you read the book of James, he's pleading with you to... He's saying, I lived with the Son of God, and yet did not believe in Him. So when you read the book of James, he's pleading with us to not do what he did. To not take for granted the Word of God. And in the third book of James, he talks about our tongue, and what our tongue does, and, and the dangers of our tongue. Our words are the most powerful thing in the universe. The word spoken. The word that we speak is a vessel to either carry faith or fear. The words you speak to people impacts their lives. You always know it when you, when you meet people and just a smile or that word you give them sometimes changes their life. And we won't know all those things until we get to heaven. But we need to be conscious of what we say, of what we impute to somebody by the words that we speak. We're a spirit, and we're created in the image of God. So we, we are capable of having the creative force with our words just as God did. If you go back to Genesis and look at the word when he said there was, the earth was without form and void, there was darkness upon the face of the earth, but the Spirit of God hovered over it, and God said, let there be light. Until God said something, nothing happened. And we're created in the image and likeness of God, so we are as little gods. You know, King James Version says we're, we're created, Elohim is in the, in the we're creating the image of Elohim, and the King James says it's angels, but the, the true translation of it means that we are created in the image and likeness of God. So our words that we speak are very, very important. And I, I don't know, over the years, my father's a pastor, and I guess, you know, we were always taught, you know, idle times, the devil's workshop, and, and be careful what you say, and, you know, and, and we always thought that the words that if you cursed, or if you said something like that, that that was using words improperly. But I truly believe what the Word of God means is if we're not building somebody up or speaking words 
as the Word of God, agreeing with what the Word of God says, and re-speaking what the Word of God says, then those words are in vain. But not necessarily saying a bad word or saying something that's not perfect. I don't think God sees that near as bad as us not speaking what God would speak in a situation in order to help someone. In Mark eleven twenty two, 22, it says, Have faith in God, which interpreted means have the God kind of faith. So we, as children of God, as little gods, as representatives of Jesus here on the earth, we need to speak with the God kind of faith. We need to use the same faith that God used in the creative force that he used it in. Ephesians 5.1 says, be ye imitators. So we need to try to act like God. We need to imitate, just as little children dress up like mom or dad, or, and they imitate you, we are to be imitating God. We are to walk in this earth. Some people, if they are not born again, and they've never met Jesus as their personal Lord and Savior, you are Jesus to them in this earth. So we need to begin to act like it, and that let our words portray that. Jesus said in John 14, 12, He that believeth on me, the works that I do, shall you do in greater works. So as we live this life, and I don't know that he meant each individual would do greater works than Jesus did, but he did mean that there's more of us and we have the same Spirit of God that living in us that he had living in him when he lived here as a man, that we are to heal the sick, raise the dead, do everything he did, but there's more of us now doing it, so it's more effective than just one of him. So we are Jesus in the earth, fulfilling the call of God on our lives, but also being a representative of Jesus to those around us. In Psalms 119, 89, it says, Forever, O God, thy word is forever settled in heaven. In Proverbs 18, 21, it says, Death and life are in the power of the tongue. So we need to live our life speaking the words that are uplifting and that are the word of God. We need to know what the word of God says, and when we speak it, we need to believe it. We need to walk in that same faith. Let's turn for a minute to James chapter 3. In verse 2, it says, For in many things we offend all. If any man offend not in word, the same is a perfect man and able to bridle the whole body. I don't think any of us are perfect yet. So if we can learn to bridle our tongue, then the word of God says we can learn to control our whole body. Proverbs 6, 1 and 2 says, Thou art snared with the words of thy mouth. Let's look at a few examples of people that had to learn to obey the words of their mouth and to walk by faith. Let's turn to Hebrews 11. In Hebrews 11, we call it the, the book of the great men of faith or the the great acts of faith. And in 6 it says, For without faith it's impossible to please him, for he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. By faith Noah being warned of God, not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house by which he condemned the world and became heir of righteousness by faith. Can you imagine the persecution that Noah felt it took him like 120 years to build the ark. 
and he built it in the middle of a desert. It had never rained on the face of the earth prior to that time. So here he was in the middle of the desert. They didn't have big trucks like we have to move that boat to the ocean. So here he was in the middle of the desert building a boat that he had no way to carry to the water for 120 years. Can you imagine what was said by those? And the Bible says he condemned those around him by doing what he did. So can you imagine how they said, what's the old crazy man doing? You know, can you just, just picture that boat compared to anything else in that time and him and his boys out there for 120 years? building that boat and anytime somebody said something about it he told them to repent he preached to them he let them know that the world was coming to an end that God had told him the world was coming to an end that they needed to turn from their wicked ways and obey God but none of them did they made fun of Noah he was alone and I'm sure his family even I'm sure his wife I'm sure his kids at times said are you sure you heard from God you know, 120 years is a long time to wait on something. But he held true, and he obeyed God, and he did what God told him to do. But I'm sure he was tempted, Pastor Bob, to say something wrong. I'm sure the words of his mouth, he was tempted to doubt. Did, God, did I really hear God? How are all those animals who will come in here, you know? I'm sure there were times when his mouth was like, Did I, is this really what I heard God say? But anyway, he obeyed God, as we all know, and it came to pass just like God told him. But let's look at Abraham. Abraham was like 100 years old, had no seed, and God spoke to him and said, you'll have a son. He went for 25 years confessing, changed his name from Abram to Abraham. So when, God, when his wife said, Abraham, dinner's ready, come in the house, she was saying, father of many nations, this man that had no children, that was in his 90s at least by then, come in the house, father of many nations. Can you imagine the ridicule there? The people snickering. You're going to have... You're a father of many nations, and you've never had a child, and you're in your 90s, and your wife is too. You know, can you imagine how he was ridiculed? But he stood strong. He kept, when he, God promised him that his seed would be as the stars in the sky, as the sand on the seashore. So when he would, at night, when he would look in the sky, he would build up his faith and say, God promised me my seed will be as those stars, unnumerable. My seed will be as the sands of the beach, unnumerable. But he had to stand in faith and confess the word of God constantly for 25 years. And we get impatient if it's one day, two days, six months. We get impatient. And we start to say things that, that put doubt into the picture. Well, Abraham waited 25 years for the promised son. And you know the story. I don't have to tell you the story. But he, he obeyed God. He stayed in faith. And his confession had to stay with what the word of God said. So I want to challenge us today to try to get to a point that the Bible says we should be slow to speak quick to hear, and slow to wrath. So we should hear, but we shouldn't be so quick to speak or so quick to get angry over something that somebody says or does to us. Amen? Amen. And then Joshua. When Joshua was at the Battle of Jericho, all those people he told, we're going to march around this city, all these days, over and over. Can't you imagine the doubt and unbelief that was in their hearts? That they wanted to say something. They marched and marched and marched and marched. But he told them, you can't say a word. You just do what I tell you. 
And then they marched around that last day seven times, not being able to talk. But he said, the last time we go around, we're going to shout. And you know the story, the walls came down. But what if they had been murmuring and bickering in between? Do you think the walls would have still come down? And if you study that, the walls didn't fall. The walls were actually pushed down in the ground. So had they been bickering, guess what so-and-so did yesterday? Or guess what so-and-so did to me or said about so-and-so? Let me tell you what so-and-so said about you. Would history be different? So what, are you, what in your life can you change by the words you speak or by the faith that you apply to the words you speak or the promises of God? We, they didn't even have the written word like we have. They had a word from God that they had to believe a prophet or a priest to tell them what God said. They had to believe that word. But we have the written word that we can, we can read and see what God said. We don't have to ask. We can go back and reread it. We don't have to go, well, now what did Joshua really say? Did I hear him right? We have the written word. Amen? Let's look at 2 Kings chapter 4. Aren't those kids great memorizing all the Bibles, the books of the Bible? That was wonderful. And the worship has been so good today. Everybody did so good singing. It was really a blessing. I know you know the story, but 2 Kings chapter 4, verse 8. And it fell on a day that Elisha passed through Shuman, where he was, there was a great woman. She constrained him to eat bread, and so it was that as often as he passed, he turned in thither to eat bread. And she said to her husband, Behold, I perceive that this is a holy man, a man of God, which passes through us continually. Let us make a little chamber, I pray thee, on the wall, and let us set for him there a bed and a table and a stool and a candle and a stick, a candlestick, that it shall be when he comes that he shall turn in hither. So she made a little room for him. So when he came by, when he was traveling by, she said, This is the prophet's room. You come here and stay. So the story goes on, and she had no children. And he asked her, what, it, what might I do for you? And she said, I would that, that you give me a child. And he said, so it will be. And she said, now, pastor, prophet, she said, don't, don't fool me. Don't tell me something you're not going to do. He said, no. By this time, when the time comes, you'll have a child. And she was very old in age also. So she had the child, and the child was a teenager, and the child fell dead. Let's look at that. And when the child was grown, it fell on a day that he went out to his father, to the reapers, and he said unto his father, My head, my head. And he said to the lad, Carry him to his mother. And when he had taken him and brought him into his mother, he sat on her knees till noon and then died. He died. The promise of God died. What would you have said? What would you have done? And she went up and laid him on the bed of the man of God and shut the door upon him and went out. And she called unto her husband and said, Send me, I pray thee, one of the young men, one of the asses, that I may run to the man of God and come again. And he said, Wherefore wilt thou go to him today? It is neither noonday nor Sabbath. It's not Sunday. Why are you going to see the preacher? It's not Wednesday night. Why are you going to see the preacher? And she said, It shall be well. And she saddled an ass and said to her servant, Drive and go forward. Slack not thy riding for me, except I bid thee. So she went and came unto him, the man of God to Mount Carmel, and it came to pass when the man of God saw her afar off, he sent Gehazi, his servant, yonder is the Shumanite. Run now, I pray thee, to meet her and say to her, Is it well with thee? Is it well with thy husband? Is it well with thy child? And she answered, It is well. And when she came to the man of God to the hill, she called him by the feet. 
and Gehazi came near her to thrust her away. See, Gehazi was his protector, so when she came near him, he went to push her back. And the man of God said, Let her alone, for her soul is vexed within her, and the Lord hath hid it from me and hath not told me. Then she said, Did I desire of thee a son, O Lord? Did I not say, Do not deceive me? Then he said to Gehazi, Gird thy loins, and take my staff in thine hand, and go thy way. If thou meet a man, salute him not. Don't speak to anybody. If any salute thee, answer him not, and lay my staff upon the face of the child. And the mother of the child said, As the Lord liveth, and as my soul liveth, I will not leave thee. And he arose and followed her. And Gehazi passed on before them and laid the staff upon the face of the child. But there was neither voice nor hearing, whether he went again to meet him and told him, saying, The child is not awakened. Then Elijah was coming to the house, and behold, the child was dead, and he laid upon his bed. He went in, therefore, and shut the door upon him, twain, and prayed unto the Lord. And he went up and lay upon the child and put his mouth upon his mouth and his eyes on his eyes and his hands on his hands. And he stretched himself upon the child and flesh of the child waxed warm. And he returned and walked in the house to and fro and went up and stretched himself upon him. And the child sneezed seven times and the child opened his eyes. And he called Gehazi and said, Call the Shumanite. So he called her, and when he was coming to, the, to him, he said, Take up thy son. But what did she say? It is well. Her child was dead. Her promised child was dead. She said, he said, How is it with thee? She said, It is well. She didn't tell anybody the boy is dead up in the prophet's room. She didn't run to her husband and say, oh, my God, my child's dead. She said, it's well. She spoke what God said, didn't she? She spoke the word of God. That's what we've got to learn to do, church. We've got to learn. You know, we say little things. You know, some things we don't even notice. It scared me to death. Excuse me? It scared you to death? It better scare you to life. Amen? Somebody says, oh, take care. Well, guess what the Bible says? Take no thought. Take no care. So if somebody tells me take care, I say no thank you. <laughs> we have to really think about the, wor the words you speak have a creative force. We are created in the likeness and image of God. When we're born again and the Spirit of God comes to live inside of us, then we have that ability to speak the Word of God with power and with force. We have that same creative power. Not long ago, my daughter-in-law, I've not even told my wife this, and she's a good girl. She prays and hears from God. And they have two little boys. We have three grandchildren, and this is the second son that has two little boys, one's five, one's seven, and they're a ball of fire, trust me. They get up at 6.30, 7 o'clock every morning, and you have to tie them down to get them to go to bed. But she's very good with them. She homeschools them, and she takes them. Part of their homeschool is they go to the Y, and they play some of their energy out while Mama exercises. And she was praying one day, and... She heard something tell her to pray for somebody who had, I don't even remember what, but it was something, one thing is sugar diabetes and one was another disease. I don't even remember the name of it, but the name of Jesus is over any disease, okay? Okay, any disease, I don't care what the name was. But anyway, in her spirit was a troubling that something would happen to one of her boys in that same area. And my son called me and said he, she was taking him, him to the doctor because they, it may have been lupus. I don't remember what it was. But it, like I said, the name of Jesus is over every disease. So when they went to the doctor, they told him it was either sugar diabetes or lupus. And my son called me to tell me. And I said, it's not. I said, none of my grandchildren will have anything like that. They'll not have it. Well, anyway, 
it went on and on. He was dehydrated. Amen? He needed some water. But my point is, if you let the devil plant that seed in your mind, you have the opportunity to take it or refuse it by the words that you speak. And if fear comes in, faith can't stay there. So we have to, when, when that thought or that seed of the enemy is planted, then we have to cast it down. We have to throw it out and begin to speak faith into that situation. None of my grandchildren will have that disease or any disease because the Word of God says they're healed, they're delivered, and they're set free. So I choose to believe what the Word of God says. Amen? Here's another example. In Luke, Luke chapter 1, Zechariah was a priest, and he was in the temple that day doing his priestly duties, whatever they may be. They did all kind of incense and things back then, and nobody could go in the Holy of Holies but the priest. Thank God for, the, for Jesus and the curtains down, right? Because we, we can go in to our Heavenly Father. Amen? But anyway, Zechariah was in there, and there appeared unto him in the 11th verse of Luke chapter 1, says, there appeared unto him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And when Zacharias saw him, he was troubled, and fear fell upon him. And the angel said unto him, Fear not, Zacharias, for thy prayer is heard. And thy wife Elizabeth shall bear a son, and thou shalt call his name John. And thou shalt have joy and gladness, and many shall rejoice at his birth. For he shall be great in the sight of the Lord, and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink, and he shall be filled with the Holy Ghost, even from his mother's womb. Wow. That's pretty powerful. And we thought they didn't know about the Holy Ghost in the Old Testament, didn't we? But anyway, and as many of the children of Israel shall turn to the Lord. Let's skip over to 18. And Zechariah said unto the angel, Whereby shall I know this? For I am an old man, and my wife well stricken in years. And the angel answering said unto him, I am Gabriel, that stand in the presence of God, and am sent to speak unto thee, to show thee these glad tidings. And behold, thou shalt be dumb, and not be able to speak, until the day those things shall be performed, because thou believest not my words, which shall be fulfilled in their season. Because you can't keep your mouth shut, and believe what I'm telling you, you will be stricken dumb. So he was stricken dumb, you know the story. For nine months he couldn't speak. Wonder why. Does that tell us something? Wonder why. So we know the child was born, and all the um, Elizabeth said his name shall be John. And they said, no, you can't name him John. There's not a John in your family. Your husband's name is Zacharias. You've got to name him after your husband. And they went to Zacharias. She said, no, his name will be John. They went to Zacharias and said, what will his name be? And he said, give me a, he asked for a pen and paper, and he wrote, his name shall be John. And when he wrote that, his mouth was loosed, and he could speak again. So his doubt, some things God tells us you can't stop. Okay, there's some, Jesus is coming back. I don't care what you say, that you can't stop that. Okay, he's returning for his glorious church. But there are things in our lives that we can stop by the way we speak, by the way we doubt, and by the way we don't walk it out in faith, and by the words that we speak. If you look a little further in that same, the first book of Luke, and in verse 28 says, The angel came unto her and said, Hail, thou art highly favored. The Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. And when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying and cast in her mind what manner of salutation this should be. And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son and shalt call his name Jesus. And he shall be great, and shall be called the Son of the Highest. 
And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. And in the 34th verse it says, Then Mary said unto the angel, How shall this be, seeing I know not a man? Now she asked a question just like Zacharias did. But Zacharias didn't believe him. Mary did believe him. She said, How shall this be, being, seeing I know not a man? And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. And in verse 38 she said, Behold the handmaid of the Lord, be it unto me according to thy word. And the angel departed. When she said that seed was planted, when he said it, when she said, be it unto me according to thy word, Life was in that seed. So when we receive the word of God and we don't receive it, we could have, she could have done just like Zacharias. She could have doubted, truly doubted. And she asked the question, how can this be? Physically speaking, this is impossible. But through God, all things are possible. And she only said, how can this be, being I know not a man? And when he told her the Holy Ghost would overshadow her, she said, then be it unto me, according to your word. And we've got to get to the point in our lives that we, we know the word of God has spoken about a situation. And we can take any promise in the word of God. It's, guess what? It's to you. It's his, it's his last will and testament to me and you. The word of God was written for you. Jesus would have died for sickness, sin, and disease. If it was just you, Pastor Bob, he would have still died. So it's for every one of us. Everything he's given, everything he's promised is for you and me. For every person that's in the body of Christ, that's born again, that's chosen to follow Jesus. So I want to ask you, are we receiving the words of promise, are we receiving what the Word of God says in every situation in our life? Probably not. I'm not. But that's my goal, to take every Word of God written or spoken and fulfill it as He's chosen for us to fulfill it. When Jesus was here, He prayed a lot. But even Jesus didn't pray the problem. He prayed the answer. He always prayed the end result. You know, back to Abraham, don't you know people made fun of him? Don't you know he had to say a million times, I'm the father of many nations. But had he, had he faltered, had he given up, where would we be today? So I guess I'm pleading with me and with you. You know, Jesus said, I don't say but what the Father says for me to say. Boy, if we could ever get to that point. To just say what God says. To be slow to speak, to be slow to wrath. The word of God conceived in the heart, formed by the tongue, and spoken by the mouth has creative power. When, that, when we receive that word and it's conceived in our heart and we speak it forth, it has creative power. What if Jesus came today? And said to you, whatever you say from this day forth, you'll have. What would we do? I challenge you today to take that in your heart and ponder it. And be desirous to please him with it. And make our lives more successful, easier, better in every way through sick 
not receiving sickness, not receiving financial problems, but living a life that's pleasing to the Father by the words that we speak. Amen? Amen. Amen. Pastor.